how do you go about sort of putting yourself out there and, and finding opportunities to showcase what your talents and what you can do? I think when you're new, everything is, um, there's so much to learn that you're kept super busy for like the first six to six months to a year, right? Because you're still learning how the company works and how you work and how you fit in and what everything looks like. Um, what I think in terms of all those extra extracurricular curiosities, um, I think it's got to be stuff that you're actually generally interested in. I, I don't, for example, I have zero interest in um, anything that is budget related, like mathematical. I, I would never, I would be a terrible finance person. I have no interest at all in doing that. Um, so I would personally try and steer clear of any optional extras that involve that. But knowing what your passions are um, is useful because your passions are quite often your strengths. So I am really interested in um, sustainability at the moment. Um, where are we sourcing things from and what's the supply chain look like and are we making the best ethical choices we can make and also I, I really care about women's rights and women's issues um as a particular interest of mine so I'm getting involved in those kind of extracurricular side activities because I, I really care about those things um I'm involved in a mentorship program I think that's really interesting so things that your strengths and your passions usually coincide and that's going to be a lot more helpful for you to maintain a curiosity and an interest in when the new sheen has worn off you know being the new girl being um the fresh face in the company so anything that you can do um that i think plays to those is is worth doing and and also i think you can be quite a little bit cynical about things and you can think well what am i missing from my skill set what am i missing from my cv what am i missing that would make me a better candidate in the future if you're job hunting for example so if you, you know that you don't have project management or you really want to go into press or pr or you'd love to do hr or something like that right then i would if that was me i would be looking to shadow somebody in one of those departments or ask some questions or having one-to-ones or doing um like one day one day once a month or half day once a month of, of um you know finding out what that team does and what that job role is it's like i would be trying to find ways to upskill using my current resources what happens when you and a lot of assistants will come out of this training session feeling much more confident that have had training on certain areas and improve that will improve their um work in general and le learn new skills and then they come out of something like this or they decide they're going to be more confident in their role and they want to be more influential but then they go back into a scenario or an environment which doesn't quite see them as that so how, what advice would you give to assistants that want to take on more work um, are probably going to have those difficult conversations with either their executives or the colleagues that don't quite understand what they do? First of all, I think I'm not going to call it a difficult conversation because I think when you call it a difficult conversation, it's also automatically a negative connotation. It doesn't have to be. I would call it, I like a crucial conversation. Like it's crucial for me, so therefore it's going to be crucial for you, right? <laughs> Um, so uh, having a crucial conversation is no one likes it, and particularly if you don't like confrontation, if you are um, somebody who naturally shies away from those kind of things and would prefer to keep it all locked down and never mention it and um, just kind of put up with it. It's, it's a hard thing to do. Um, so I think, first of all, you, you have to focus on the issue, uh, not the person. So it needs to not be emotional. Um, I think you have to lead with the truth. You have to be authentic. Uh, you have to pace yourself. Don't rush it. Um, I think take the time to collect your thoughts. Um, get perspective on what really, what really is, what, what is your desired outcome. And I'm a, quite a big fan of, I, I don't terribly like confrontation. I, I, I I don't find it easy um, so what I do is I practice it first uh, I take all the time I need to kind of write down all the stuff that I'm stressing about or like I'm, I'm struggling with and then I read back through it and then I work out what is actually emotional and what is factual and then I start to just pull out the factual and then I 
I try and make the tone and the words that I'm choosing to use non-confrontational and non-emotional. So it's purely neutral and it's purely, I feel this because of X, Y, Z. Um, and so by the time I've had, I had the conversation in real life with the actual human being, I've had it so many times to myself um, or to the mirror or, you know, to my partner or whatever, that actually I, I've, it's kind of boring now because I've done the conversation so many times that I'm not scared about, I'm not frightened and I can't control the reaction of the outcome of the person who's on the receiving end, but I can certainly predict or kind of think my way around how might I feel if I was being told this. Um, and I, I think sort of taking the um, fear of the confrontation out by practicing is a really top tip that I, I, I don't know if anyone else does, but I, I well, do. Yep, yeah, I do it. The shower is my place. <laughs> That's where I do my pra conversation practices. <laughs> Um, Kirsty, is there anything you could add there in terms of um, wanting to, to do more and then how you explain that um, to, your, to your executive or to your colleague? Mm. Um, I totally agree with it. Uh, facts, these are the only things that resolve because it's also, you know, if you have your half an hour or your hour that you schedule in the diary to do that, you know, you think that the meeting beforehand is going to be a nice and easy one. They're going to they're going to enter to your meeting with it's going to land. It's going to be so good, um, and uh, it might not be the case. So I do exactly the same. I I do first different scenarios. I have my okay. If, if the mood is like that, we kind of tackle this one. I'm kind of prepare myself over like yeah. I it, it's very important that you have your facts and you're able to deliver. Don't get emotional. Um, you're Rehearse it to the point where you yeah you are bored and um, that's kind of goes back to the confidence bit that it has to be like a river for you you have to own it you you know that your message is correct but you need to have the facts to actually resonate down with your your executive and then they see the value in it and they'll see how you, you know, your management skills your kind of your, how you take the leadership that um, you see the human elements, you see the facts and how you tie it together and and this is where you will add the value. Yeah, I completely agree. It's also, if you don't get the outcome that you wanted from those conversations, I think as long as you've gone into them and mm. you've laid out the facts and you've taken emotion out of it, like you say, Abby, then even if you don't get the results that you necessarily want, I think it really shows that you take your career and actually what you want to offer really seriously and it, the next opportunity that comes along, then you might get put forward for that, or you might again ask for it with a bit more confidence than you had in the previous conversation. So I think it's always worth, if you come out of something like a training session full of, you know, verve and confidence and you really want to move forward, but it doesn't quite work, it doesn't mean the next time it won't, you know, going forward. 